and uh, we're excited um, for the panelists that we have here. I'm going to actually leave it up to Heidi and the, the panelists to introduce uh, everybody here. Um, but we've got an illustrious group, so we're very excited to have them. And um, as, uh, as you know, the topic for today is, is uh, mentoring um, and, and student retention. Now, sometimes the word retention can be a bit of a loaded term. And so I'm going to, so I'm going to clarify, I guess, a little bit about what we mean when we're talking about retention today. Oftentimes we hear the word retention and we think of, of uh, you know, uh, budgets and enrollment numbers and things that administrators worry about, whereas this is a teaching um, gathering. So what does that have to do with us? Well, one thing we've found is that in many cases, um, students who are trying to be successful here in college and have lots of potential here um, will sometimes hit roadblocks that, are, that they can overcome, that are, that are surmountable, but they don't always have the resources uh, right there to help them. And oftentimes that resource, that nudge, will come in the form of a teacher um, or a good advisor. And so that's the kind of effort that we're talking about today. That which helps students um, who have all the capability in the world of being successful here get over uh, some of those obstacles through nudging and through helping them along. And so this really could be called um, student success through mentorship and caring. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to actually turn the time over to Heidi and let her introduce our panelists and do our awards. Okay. And do the panelists need to use this? I don't, uh, we're setting up a... Okay, all right. So my name is Heidi Kessler, and I am the Director of Student Retention and Completion here at Utah State. I love the clarification, because what I do is not about, um, it's not just about the numbers and the money. In fact, very little about that. It really is about student success. And it really is about helping students to make the right connections so that they can meet their potential while they're here. And to try to help them navigate while they're here as well. And so I love this partnership with ETE. This is our second year of doing this. And um, we know that you, the faculty, are the ones who spend the most time with students. And, um, and so that faculty relationship is so important. Um, Last year, we started a new um, award on campus, and um, we have two awards. Last year, we awarded um, a Teacher of the Year, and that was Tanya Triplett, and we also um, awarded a Researcher of the Year, and that was Christina Sharp and she does research on, on estrangement and kind of the transition that students make as they come to college. Um, this year, we've got two awards again, a teacher again, and then also an, an advisor of the year. An advisor of the year. Um, and so to make those awards, this is an award that our Vice President of Student Affairs, James Morales, has made possible and um, representing him is his associate vice president, Eric Olson. So I'll turn some time over to you. Thank you, Heidi. It's a, a pleasure to be here and, and to uh, <clears throat> announce these awards. So the, for the advisor of the year, the recipient is uh, Shelly Katinik from Natural Resources. And I invite uh, Claudia and Pete Mookie if you want to come up to Uh, in our college, we think has really made a difference 
and students being able to present the program. this photo op, let me just explain a little bit about um, the process for both of these awards. Each college was invited to make one nomination for each of the awards and then we had um, a group of advisors um, score the, on the rubric for the advising one and then also faculty for the faculty one, the teaching one. And so, um, so this is really your peers that have recognized this as well as your administrators. So congratulations, Shelley. And this is working now, I think, for the students. Okay. okay. Is it working? Mm -hmm. All right. The teacher of the award recipient is Dr. Carrie Rood, Associate Professor of Veterinary Medicine. And They didn't. And just all around. And just know? everything else. <laughs> and we'll invite uh, Carrie and Brian up, uh, Brian Warnick. Carrie's been known to stop by my office a time or two, so anyway. This is awkward. It's like we either turn our back to you or to the rest of the group. So, Brian, if you Okay, I'll just share a couple sentences from the nomination. Uh, Dr. Root understands the importance of students getting off to a great start by making connections with faculty members, Dr. Er, with faculty mentors, excuse me. Dr. Root has enthusiastically embraced our freshman welcome event and interacts positively with students, encourages them to connect early with faculty and to be involved in student organizations, participate in, in internships and do well in classes. Whenever a pre-veterinary student is struggling, needs encouragement, or has questions, Dr. Rue is usually the first to respond. So congratulations, Dr. Rue. Thank you, Derek Tollefson. I am the head of the Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology, and uh, my my area is, is social work, where I've done teaching. Was at the UNA Basin campus for about ten more or more years, um, and uh, directed the MSW Master of Social Work program from there. Um, I think that's enough. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
Oops. Uh, Don Busenbach, I'm a math lecturer out in the Una Basin also. I'm in the so math and statistics department. I just uh, started this last fall full-time, but I've been a, a adjunct for 15 years with Utah State out in the Una Basin and loved it and had the opportunity to come in as a full-time lecturer. Hi, I'm David La out in the Una Basin as well. I'm an associate professor in human development and family studies and talking with Jennifer, she didn't know we had a name change, formerly FCHD. So uh, excited to be here and share with you some of the things we're doing out in the Una Basin regarding mentoring. So I'm Jen, um, Jen Gruy. I'm in the psychology department and I am on the Logan campus. I'm a lecturer in the department. Hi, my name is Crescencio Lopez Gonzalez. I'm here in Logan too, I'm an assistant professor in the language, languages, communication, and philosophy, and we're all put together in that one group. Um, I'm here to share some of the stories. Awesome. All right, we'll open it up to questions. Don't be shy. All right, I'll start then. Jen yes. and others, um, you have large classes. Uh, how do you, how are you able to feel like you're a mentor to individual students when your classes are so large? So I think, so there's a few different things that I think have helped me be successful in those large classes. Um, one thing is being really accessible to my students. Um, this doesn't mean that like I have them over for dinner, but it does mean that I try and give them a lot of different ways um, that they can get a hold of me. I try and have really quick um, response uh, time. I there's been a few things that I've incorporated this last year that I've really liked, uh, and the students seem to have really liked. I have a Google Voice number that actually connects to my cell phone, and so a lot of students text me now. Um, and so I can give them a number. I mean, they can still call me and leave a voicemail, but that seems to be super unpopular. Um, they really like to text, and so um, that's really helped. I think another thing that's helped in, um, oh, and then also with being more accessible, I've also tried to use um, some different scheduling programs. So students, you know, I, we have those open office times where nobody ever shows up. You know, you have like several office, you, you're, twiddling your thumb, and well, doing things, being productive. Um, <laughs> but there are, I, when I give them, for some reason, if I give them a link and they sign up for a time that pops up on my calendar, even though you know it's still during some office hours that I have, that extra commit, they show up, they come, they feel like it's, you know, I'm more committed to um, listening and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I think that's been really helpful. I think also being really, I've tried to be pretty knowledgeable about um, resources on campus. So when I do have those one-on-one -on -one interactions, I know who to call and I knew who to connect them with. Um, particularly if it's something that I don't, for example, this last semester, I had a, one of my online students, um, I was reading her papers and I'm trying to keep this short because I know our time. Um, and I, as I read her assignments, I realized she was very intelligent, but she was struggling because it was English as a second language. She was, I think she was in Kuwait. Um, and so I was able to get on the phone and talk to, I was able to get a hold of Dennis um, really easily in the Academic Success Center. And he was able to video conference and kind of help her with some skills that she needed to be more successful, in not just my class, but other classes. And if I hadn't, had that knowledge or known where to go, I think that student would still be probably struggling. So, anyway. so how did you know about Dennis and where to send? So I think a, a lot of that came, um, has come about the years of, you know, really caring about my students and trying to say, okay, this person has really a real problem. You know, it's something outside the realm of expertise I have, so who can I get to know that can help them? But I think also my work with Connections, which is our first year um, 
experience course for first year students helped me really make a lot deeper, more meaningful connections with those um, resources on campus to be able to provide them with good information. Awesome. Other questions? Or do you want me to keep going? Yeah. Oh. Me? <laughs> so I'm interested in, for the whole panel, whoever wants to respond, Sometimes mentoring means you've got to tell students hard things, that they're not meeting a standard, they're not getting into your major, that they're not a good writer. How do you, how do you have those kind of conversations in a way that aren't devastating to the student? How do you make them productive? Good question. Hard question. I can answer, but I'm happy to let some, another voice be heard. <coughs> So uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I think is helpful when you have those conversations is to have thought out ahead of time what some alternative pathways might be for that student and to help them become aware uh, that you know, although they may not be getting into the social work major, um, that there's still pathways that they can take that will work for them, help them maybe in a, in a different route than they had thought about, but can still help them get to where they want to go. So rather than just saying, you know, sorry, you're out of luck, uh, try to help them see that there, there are different plans that might work for them. Okay, well, I was just gonna, I, the, the <clears throat> thing that I thought about with giving bad news, I. I completely agree with the point that's been made. Um, I would also think a lot of times I come in contact with, not a lot, but student cheating. And so sometimes I have to fail a student and it stinks, I hate it. Um, and I've always tried to frame it with the students that you know this is a mistake you made. It just doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means that um, you know, this is a learning opportunity. And trying to frame things in terms of, let's see what you can learn and take from this and how you can be a better student, a better person, moving forward. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I thought that was a great question. Thank you. Um, the, uh, what are some things you look for that are signals to you that somebody needs maybe a little bit extra attention or that there's some return on reaching out to somebody um, more than you might otherwise do? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I just, just this past week, as I, I teach uh, one of my classes over the IVC system, and um, one of, in one of the introductions, one of the students at one of the distant sites said that she really enjoyed research. And that's kind of unusual in, in, in this class, and she also liked statistics. And, and so, so right there I knew this was probably a student that had some real unique interests and maybe a path to academics, but would probably need some extra guidance from, from somebody that uh, could help her uh, along that path. And so I, I think that's as, just during the normal conversations, Neil, of looking for challenges and opportunities there. Um, out in the Uinta Basin, where Don and I and Derek formerly taught, a lot of our students are first generational students. And so they don't come with a lot, oftentimes, of family support and, and uh, parents that are guiding them and have been through that road before themselves. And so, so recognizing that, looking up and, and seeing, you know, that's one of the markers we can, can look up on in the different uh, recording systems that we have to see if they are first generational students. And so I think just being aware of that and then looking at that as opportunities to, to, to reach out to that student. And then there's obvious ones, you know, missed assignments, uh, not, not coming to class anymore, I think are real red flags that if we look for them, they can be great opportunities. I also work with um, first generation students and for me it's creating the space for students 
to thrive in that space. Um, for example, I work with um, Latinos here on campus, and I began by telling one student to bring me another floor and start a program or um, a club in this case. And we also created a Facebook page where it's a private Facebook page where we communicate and we put um, topics that are interest to us only. Um, we also have a messenger where we constantly communicate with one another <coughs> through messenger. So it's creating the space that allows the students to um, come forward with what's following them. And it's, it's, so I do, I, I would say that I do two types of mentoring. One is research, and that happens for the most part in the classroom. Um, the other one is outside the classroom, with, where um, I, become in con I, become, I, I come in contact with Latinos. And since there's not a lot of us here on campus that are role models for them, they kind of gravitate towards me to uh, help them. And, and talk to them about my own obstacles going through uh, education, public <coughs> education. So as, as um, since, since I've been here, uh, the, 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 the club that I, that I started uh, three years ago, uh, we named, the, named the, uh, the Latinx Creative Society to change the thinking of Latinos uh, not being servants, but creators. A lot of the times, Latinos <coughs> tend to perceive themselves as, as individuals who are um, serving at a restaurant or providing basic services. But when, when you start telling them that that's not what they're here for at the university, that are actually contributors to society, it begins to change their, their way of thinking. And, and for us, uh, I, I don't want to take too long to, but um, it, it has been through interviewing Latinos. Uh, almost uh, not just important Latinos in our community, but just Latinos who have a story to tell. And we have interviewed, I don't know, 15 different Latinos. And, and through that, the story of our community has come through, and we have learned through that story, and empowered ourselves through that story. At the same time, we have been empowering ourselves through our own culture, and we created uh, a um, kind of a festival, a procession, around the Day of the Dead celebration. So now uh, it started from 25 students participating, and la this past year was uh, 150 <coughs> students participating in, 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 in the procession. So it is creating the space for the students to try. And it, it is the same idea in the classroom with research. <coughs> I'd be interested to hear from the panel members or the members of the audience. Uh, your department has a freshman orientation course. Our department of animal dairy and veterinary sciences, after a seven or eight year hiatus without a freshman orientation course, we now are planning to resurrect one with the goal to help incoming students, particularly freshmen, but transfer students have a sense of home within the animal dairy and veterinary sciences department. And, and we have some ideas that we're contemplating employing in, in that freshman uh, orientation course. But I'd like to hear other experiences along those lines. What, what has worked, what hasn't worked, et cetera. Can, I can speak to um, the Quinney College of Natural Resources has, a, has an orientation course. It's WILD 2000. It's a one credit course that all of nine of our majors are required to take. It's an incredible course as far as getting students connected and, and creating that space and that home for our students. Um, they, um, we have them kind of divided up. We have four faculty teaching, and it's sort of done by department. So they not only get a home in the college, but then a home in their department. And then you know, meeting their peers and making those connections. One of the assignments in the course is to meet with me and to meet with their faculty mentor. 
So really the whole course is to connect them. And we have um, peer advisors that go and speak and get introduced in that course, so they really just get all the resources we have available, internships, scholarships, um, just all that ways of co-curricular connection, and I think it's, it's really effective. That's At what point do they take it? Usually the first semester. Like that's how it's, you know, um, that's how we advise it is the first semester, and then it doesn't always happen that way, but it's usually that first semester is probably like to get them, so they can just get that information right away. Yeah, aviation technology <coughs> raised there. Uh, we have an aviation 1100 class that's very similar. So the first day class, I talked about the major. Um, so it's designed as a as a first semester class for the students. I also bring the aviation peer as well as academic advisor. I bring in clubs. So student clubs come and present their different ideas how to stay connected. And I bring in some guest speakers from industry. So I bring a helicopter pilot, an airline pilot, maintenance air traffic controllers, so they can see all the different careers in that aviation technology degree, as well as Air Force ROTC. And over the course, they have three major assignments. One is to meet with their aviation advisor and order, I uh, get many uh, students that are general, searching, undeclared, they come visit, or some people hear that it's a fun class and they come anyway. So they meet with whoever their academic advisor is. They're supposed to interview somebody in the profession they'd like to go. So they seek out a pilot or a maintenance individual or business leader, somebody, and to talk to them, what would you give me as advice for my college experience? So that they can start to focus on that. And, uh, and then the third one is to look at a resume. And the idea is that what you want your resume to look like when you graduate. What leadership, what volunteer experiences, and, and then we help them create a, a plan to get to that point of graduation. So it's a, it's a very important way to connect all the students together because even though we're about 400 in aviation technology, it's still a pretty small program. You're going to see all these students in classes, so I remind them how important it is to, to make sure you're friends with the folks that sit around you because you're going to be in all the same classes as you progress through the major. But I think it's vital to have that early on in their career to, in college to be able to make those connections and have that ability to look for those resources. But let me finish. I bring in our career coach. And that's one of the funnest lessons, because they come in there and they talk about all the resources that are available to them from essay, scholarship essay writing assistance, and resume, interview skills. And she gives one of the great stories. We had a student who graduated who was having a little problem finding a job. So as an alumni, I was an Aggie, he came to her, revised his resume to target for a specific job, did some interview prep, and the very next, next job application, we got an interview and got hired. And so there's a great success story. And I think having her come in, as well, Julie Morley is just a fantastic resource for the students and uh, talk about all the resources on campus. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to meet with you offline if you want to. Maybe this is a good time to, to ask um, Dave and, and John what it is. So they have done a lot of work over the last year to um, create a mentor <coughs> program. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I was uh, brought in, as I said, in August, and, and the faculty last spring had noticed a, a, a concern about student uh, success, student retention, and had uh, decided to look at a faculty mentoring program. And so when I came in the fall, they asked me to be the chair of the committee, and that's why I'm here. Is, uh, Dave asked me to chair the committee, and we've been working, uh, putting things together. Last fall, we uh, met as a faculty, uh, discussing the program and one of the concerns was faculty were concerned is exactly what their role was what you know where what information they should have at their fingertips what they should have and so we put together a uh, in our student success committee put together a faculty mentoring guide uh, with the help of the committee uh, in the unit basin uh, we uh, shared ideas in our committee and put together we think a pretty good starting document of things that as a resource, for example, students may need help with technology, they may help, need help with counseling, they may need help with scholarships or those types of things, and those uh, resources are available for faculty to find very easily. Uh, resources to discuss uh, what you can or you know, what you should consider as a faculty and helping students talking about the importance of getting a college degree and how valuable that is. As uh, Dave mentioned, we have a lot of first, you know, first time college students that have, their families never been in, involved in college and so this is a unique experience for them and we want to show them the, the value of that. Um, the, the big thing I think is as we uh, discussed in our 
uh, student success was, was making sure that we're developing those relationships so that students will be more persistent in their educational uh, goals and, and, and their educational opportunities as they go forward. And so we have been trying to help and put that together. Um, we've been working for quite a while. We're still working on it. It's a dynamic uh, situation as we're going forward. But uh, I'm already seeing just the fact as a faculty that we've been discussing it, that that faculty is, is already more, I think, uh, cognizant of, of faculty mentoring and what they're trying to help students and thinking about those things. And, you know, there, there is always concerns as we go forward, but the, the concerns have been good. We've been able to address those, I think, as a, as a student success committee and being able to discuss those ideas. And, and it's actually come up, I think, with uh, some better plans and better ideas as we move forward. And so, you know, everyone's got different ideas of what it looks like. And so it's important that you have the dialogue. Uh, we're small enough in the basin that we could get together as a faculty and discuss those ideas and, and, and work them out. So uh, I'll let Dave finish anything I missed. I'm sure I missed something. Thank you. Um, give you a little context to this. We, and I'm sure the same discussions in your departments here in Logan, we've been talking about student success and retention and faculty mentoring for years. And we've had committees formed to, to do this. And, and uh, in, in spite of these efforts, nothing's ever really gotten traction. And so I think, I think a couple of things uh, ha have happened in the UNA Basin. One, our uh, uh, local administration with, with Dr. Taylor and then also Dr. Etchberger at the regional campus level. Uh, we had a, a faculty meeting about a year ago and it was, it was a clear directive and a request from upper administration, please stop talking and let's do something. And so this uh, student success committee was formed. Uh, John Barton chaired it uh, spring semester. And we started to have discussions about what would this look like and what would be the uh, expectations. Um, we started to, uh, I, m myself and a couple uh, other folks, uh, La La Latricia and Trish Kingsford, Latricia Fall, started to work on the research component of it and the IRB process. And um, that started to take form. Uh, we submitted it in the, the IRB last summer and just got accepted now. So a little word of caution, you know, <laughs> these things always take longer than, than, than you anticipate. And, and so, um, and then in the spring, uh, or in the fall semester, uh, the Student Success Committee, and I just want to mention who's on that committee. Uh, Cameron Kutch, Assistant Director. Marilyn Kutch, she's in Secondary Ed. Uh, Patrick Harvey, Social Work. Mike Christiansen, uh, Chemistry. Trish uh, Kingsford and Latricia Fallen, our Student Services. Then we have a great group of faculty out there who are uh, solely researchers in air quality who have also joined us. And so this Student Success Committee put together a guide to try to address some of these concerns. What are the expectations? What does mentoring look like? How do you reach out and make contact to a student? How do you deal and help a student that may be struggling? And we found that the faculty have a wide variation of comfort level with those. You know, the, so, some are very comfortable and they, it's kind of second nature to them. Others, you can tell it's pretty uncomfortable and, and, and they're nervous about, about that request. And so as we, as we talked about this, this, this guide has, has been produced and we're, we're just now in a place where we, we're trying to implement something system wide. And, and I'm really, I'd really like to commend our UNA Basin faculty. 88% of them are in this program. They, they, they're, they're, they're in it, they, they want to serve. And what's, what's been really refreshing to me, even those faculty members who may have some concerns about how we're implementing this program are all in with the fact of, of that, that mentoring is important. And so this has been, this has been fun, to, fun to see. Uh, you know, we're trying to do something that's systemic. I also, I also want to tout how important organic 
mentoring is, and this is probably not maybe a discussion that we'll have too. Both of those, both of those are important, and we've tried to give our faculty, one of the things we've, we've really learned is we want to give our faculty a lot of latitude here. We're not saying you have to meet with the students this number of times or in this setting. We're, 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 we're providing funding for them, we're providing training for them, um, but, but our two goals is, and this comes from the work of Vincent Tinto, we want our students to feel connected to the social community and the intellectual community. And in the regional campus system, we're a little different because we don't have football games, we don't have dances, we don't have those kind of social events. But even though we're different, we also have this amazing opportunity because we have a great faculty to student ratio. And so I think we can really excel in the intellectual uh, com um, connection that a student has with our campus. So we're hoping to do some research on this. We're just now in the process of seeing how many students uh, want to be involved, and then we'll, we'll, we'll match them with certain faculty based on major uh, or what we anticipate as their major, their place of residence, and those kinds of things. But we're really excited and feel very fortunate to have our faculty support and also administrative support to implement this. I would just add that they have been very generous in sharing what they've learned and so I'm sure if you contact them, they um, would be happy to, to send you the PDF of their documents and, and share with, with you so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can just tweak the wheel to make your department. And, and this was a, a, a very collaborative effort. Uh, Seth Lyman was very instrumental in developing this document. We have 12 copies here that we brought with us. If any of you would like a copy, uh, meet with Don and I after and we'll be happy to give you a copy or send us an email and we'll send you a PDF file. It might be nice to put it on the UT website. Oh yeah, yeah. good idea. A link. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an excellent document. <coughs> I just have a question for you guys. I have about 45, 50 regional campus students that I advise and how best from your standpoint is it to reach them? I mean I'm, I'm trying a couple of different things but some of them I'm noticing aren't reaching out and having advising appointments or they're not responding to emails and so I would like some feedback on what you feel like might work better for my regional campus students. Don, you want to say anything? Well, I, I, you know, just, just in thinking, hopefully that's where we can help in our situation is as we are uh, implementing our faculty mentoring program. If we can identify those students and, and especially those that may need a little help with their persistence and, and moving forward. Maybe if we can match them with that and we can help and we recognize that we can help you and then maybe through that if you're not able to get with the student maybe if you contacted us you know and let's say hey I've got this student out there do they have a faculty mentor and we can kind of work together in that process. That's how I kind of envision this as, as it goes forward is that we as the, as the regional campuses can help the, those of you that are you know, uh, lecturing out to those sites and, you know, if you're not able to contact or get with that student, maybe we can help in that manner, especially if we already have a faculty aligned with them to help them. I think that would be one uh, idea just off the top of my head. And, and, you know, really we should all be working. I was thinking the same thing as I, I also lectured to, you know, a lot of different sites and I'm thinking the same thing, you know, they, they mentioned uh, about students who may be struggling and you look at assignments and and things and, and one of the things I found that's helped me was uh, hope if a student you know bombs the first test you know we learn a lot not just from uh, doing things correctly in math which is what I do but you also learn from your mistakes so I went through and typed up every question they missed on the test sent it to them and said if you'll send me the, the corrections what tell me what you did wrong and you know what you were thinking and then uh, I didn't give them full credit or half credit, I gave them just a few points on their assessment just to let them know, hey, I care, I want you to do successful, be successful and you can, you can be. And, though, and, and some still didn't even do that even though they had an opportunity, but I was just thinking if, if we can provide those opportunities of hope and say, hey, we do care. And, and like I said, I think as a regional campus we can help if we can get those students, you know, aligned with the mentor, so. I, Derek, you Derek, you've had a lot. On the distance, Ed, what are your? Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Marilyn Kutch, and I'm a part of the mentoring committee in Roosevelt in the U.S. Basin. And I want to tag on to that as uh, I teach online at IBC and also the hybrid, the flipped classroom, along with advising. Uh, congratulations, Shelly. You did great. She's awesome. Uh, well deserved. I wanted to say a couple of points. Uh, as a minority faculty member, a key component of trying to uh, really engage with, with any of the backgrounds of my students. I try to kick in, tell me about yourself from the beginning. And, and really, before I even start to help them, how are you doing, what's going on, how, what classes uh, are you having trouble with, any, anything that they want to share first. So connect with that human being and listen. The second point, as then I put on my other hat as a regional campus advisor, we, we are in these remote areas and sometimes just giving a call over to another advisor in another regional campus because they're seeing them coming in and out, that can be your hands and your feet that you can't get to. Um, and I, I work closely with other advisors and just even having somebody send me an email and say, do you, are you aware of anything with this student or could you, uh, if you see the student, could you say, you know what, Marilyn Kutch wanted to talk to you. Uh, here's her number, here's her email, touch base with her. And it's a good thing as a parent, you know, you say, it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, so those are my two points I wanted to make. Yeah, I would just add, <clears throat> add to what Marilyn and, and Dave and Don have said. For the regional students, I think those local, utilizing those local connections as much as possible um, is really helpful because they will, I think, maybe connect easier, you know, more quickly, more readily with somebody from the area. They, uh, having spent a, a lot of years out there in, in regional campuses, students there view Logan as the big um, mothership mothership <laughs> Wizard of Oz kind of thing and it's like that that's outside of their ability to comprehend it's like that's that's too much that's overwhelming to connect with Logan and um, yeah which is not true I mean everybody's here is really helpful but it's their perception for many of them and so using those local resources where they exist is important can I add one thing? Please. I just, so this may not be super popular, but I, one thing I have figured out with my years of teaching my online and the distance students is they don't do eight to five. And so I've had to, I make calls at night. I make calls on the weekend. I had students um, a couple months ago that needed to meet with me and I, I got up and I met with um, on the computer video conferencing at 6 a.m. I mean, so their lives, I notice, are very busy and they have full-time jobs and full-time family. And so I kind of had to change my way of thinking that I can make a phone call after 5 and it's okay. And I can talk to a student at 8 o'clock at night. That's okay. So, but like I said, it may, it may not be super popular. <laughs> <laughs> Derek, um, I know that you, this, especially this last semester, you've kind of piloted something in Chess. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think this is a part Matt's scheme and part my scheme, I guess. And so what what we're trying, and, and I continue to, to work with this, is there's a, a, a wonderful little data mining tool Civitas that the university has invested in and I'm able as a department head to go in and and uh, basically sort of reverse engineer a regression model where at the end of that it it gives me a list of students who are at risk for not graduating or not persisting or um, those kinds of things and so uh, what we did is use that identified uh, a group of students first in social work who the regression model suggested were not likely to persist and uh, reached out to four of them and said let's go to lunch so I got three of them 
to you know, and it actually took. Uh, I first and I first initially emailed them nothing back, and so then I had my wonderful administrative assistant email them and invite them to lunch, and they all replied <laughs> to Courtney. Uh, something about a department head emailing them, I guess, was scary. They thought they were in trouble, um, and so. We had to persist in that process. Finally got three of them to agree to meet me at the Sky Room for lunch. And um, these were students that the model suggested were not likely to persist in social work given um, the big predictor was their, their initial grade in Social Work 1010. So met, met for uh, lunch and um, I didn't know them and they didn't know me. And, um, I was immediately struck by what I quickly learned about their lives. This is what Marilyn was talking about, getting to know their life. And um, so that's kind of where we started. And all three of them were first generation students. Uh, two of them were Latinas. And there was just a bunch of other sort of at risk check boxes that I was going through in my head and so we just had a talk you know, they had no idea that because they got lower than an A minus um, or B plus in social work 1010 that their chances of being admitted to that major were slim to none they had no idea that, that's the nature of the competitive you know people trying to get into the social work major and they had no idea so but I said did you know that we actually have a program in regional campuses? Two of them lived in Brigham City and, and had no idea that they could get admitted to the program in Brigham City if they didn't get admitted here. So I just shared that information. Hey, I had a hard conversation. You know, you're, just so you know, your chances of, of making it here are tough. Um, Right or wrong, it's, it is what it is. So, uh, and then we talked about these alternative pathways. Look, you, you two of you live in Brigham City. Oh, that would be way easier for my life. Okay, good. So let's get you plugged in there so that you can pers you know, continue with what you want to do. And I said, by the way, if for whatever reason that doesn't work, here's, here's another pathway you could think about. You can get the social work minor and still ultimately get to where you want to go but just getting to know them and and what they were facing and sharing information was really uh, important I learned a lot I passed that on to the social work uh, program uh, speaking of these orientations they're now in the process of thinking about how do we have this freshman level talk um, they do a really good job with the juniors and seniors in having a socializing orientation, but with the freshmen, I'm afraid that, that too many of them don't get the informa information they need early enough to make some course corrections. And I love this idea of uh, giving them hope, you know, at the, at the test, I mean, first assessment <coughs> level, but also at the program level, um, you know, having the honest talks, we're not, we're not going to just give you free points. Right. Um, we're not going to just let you in. So it's an honest talk, but at the same time, there are options. And there are things you can intervene in your own experience to change this course a little bit. And I, I think that that's kind of at the core of what mentoring really is um, for mm -hmm. faculty. So I love that. Yeah, Michael. I'm Michael from Advising. Um, one of the things we've been learning about students is that for students who graduate, only 35% of them are in the major that they were admitted into. Mm -hmm. For students who do not graduate, 75% are still in their first major. And so the implications that we're learning for advising are huge because if you come to me in social work and I'm just giving you the information for social work and really not having good conversations about your academic strengths and where it is that you're trying to go, we might be missing the boat a little bit. So with all of these students that might be swirling around, if I'm the social work advisor, but I've got a student who might not be making progress or might maybe need some an additional plan, but I'm not connected to psychology or FCHD, 
a, a referral to an academic advisor can be about planning, yeah. um, you know, what classes you might be taking and having good conversations about that. <clears throat> but what do you suggest for us as an advising body to help students get connected to faculty or to co-curricular experiences that aren't in our home college or our home department? And would it be, you know, we have, I'm looking at our advisors over here, we always have good conversations with students about their classes and their faculty. Would it be appropriate for us to talk to one of these wanderers and say, who's your favorite faculty person right now? They can help you get connected to some resources. Is What's the best referral or what's a good way our advising system can help support faculty and help students stay motivated or be in the right major sooner? Thoughts? I'll, I'll take this thought of that, Michael. Um, I, I think w one of the neat things at the regional campus level is we're so small. And, and, so, and so as you look at our student success committee, it was, it was not only made up of faculty, but also, also our advisors. And, and so they were all, they were all in, in this together. So I think that's a benefit of, of being uh, in, in, in a small, smaller campus. And, and I think, to, to, to me, at, at, at the end of the day, you're really trying to help the student feel connected. We've thrown out a lot of words here, hope, mm -hmm. connection, somebody that cares, cares about me. So I think, I think it is appropriate as an advisor to, to reach out and, and if, they, if they identify a faculty member that they, yeah, I really like this particular faculty member, I think it's very appropriate for, for an advisor to, you know, we, 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 some of our advisors will walk, we have great advisors in the basin, they'll, they'll walk a student to a faculty member's office unannounced and, and you know, ask, would you be willing to meet with so-and-so? If not, could, or if this isn't a good time, could we uh, rearrange it? But I think that's the whole culture that a good mentoring system supports is that kind of give and take, that organic, uh, concern that grows in into not just the connection with the advisor but also a faculty member that may be outside of that person's particular department and major at the time. So I think it's a great idea. My department head colleagues may not like what I'm about to say but if all else fails direct the student or, or have the advisor send an email to a department head and say hey, I've got a student who's sort of broadly interested in this. We'll, we'll know our faculty. We'll, I mean, we know what they're doing. It's, it's take me two seconds to reply, oh, you know, have them contact so-and-so, or I would then send an email and, and try to connect the two of them together. So I think that's a pathway. I, think, I don't think there's any wrong doors as long as we're trying to make connections, right? That's, that's the key. And I completely agree with that. I would just say um, having you kind of help the student make the connection. I noticed years ago when I would tell students, I need you to, I want you to go visit um, with the academic success center, or I want you to go visit with your academic advisor, or they don't do it. They, they don't follow it. through. And so having, for some reason, like, like I keep using the academic success center as an example, but for some reason me having like a form and filling it out with them and having them sign that they will and then contacting me following through and contacting that person that I know of there um, the students show up and they and and I think um, good faculty they'll email you back and they'll say sure let me make some time and um, but having you actually follow through and help that student make that connection is really helpful and it's going to be um, a lot better experience rather than the student walking out of there and saying, yeah, I'll get to that, and then they never do. So. Michael, I think, I think systemically, too, I think your, your question also begs the question, what, what's the safety net for this student? You know, may, maybe you're concerned and, and maybe you take them and you walk and you go visit a faculty member, but they're not in. And you say, okay, well, give, give me, let's try it again when you come back, okay? And you kind of leave it that way. I think too many times for, for these students that are, uh, may have a low or a high, a low persistence rate, mm -hmm. um, too, many, too many times we don't close the loop with them. And, and so, so, so they're still not 
uh, getting the resources and the help and the hope that, that they need. So I think systemically, even the, the entire university needs to look at that and, and, and come up with a, a system where we can close that loop and that student is supported instead of falling through the cracks. I have a question. Um, this, oh, this is Marilyn Kutch again in Roosevelt. And uh, recently we had a department head interviews, and one of the department chairs discussed the needs that all universities and colleges are going through right now of, of adjusting to the needs of more online learners. But she also looked at the needs assessment that they also found for mentoring students and also recruiting students. And that is more students want to take online approaches, but they want to be within 50 to 80 miles of the place that they are taking the classes from so they can walk in and still be able to talk with someone when they have exhausted all of their own resources and abilities to get information. And I think that as we look at, well, we'll send more mass emails out one of the key components that she also shared was that people are not checking their email. They are, as the panel um, individual said, she, they prefer texting and would choose to decide the time that they will, re they will respond back to you. So we have to adjust the time periods as particularly when they are working, which you can look on your analytics on your classroom schedule, they're working later into the day, earlier into the early morning hours. So those are pieces as, as we look at mentoring we probably need to keep in mind. Thank you. We've got a question over here. So for a little weak point and then a question, one thing we haven't really mentioned yet is the mechanism for reporting concerns about students. So if you have a student in your class you've tried to reach out to, they're not responding to text or email, you can file an on that, that form, that student concern report. Mm -hmm. I did that what, last semester, and I actually, that student was contacted, and then that student contacted me and said, I can't believe you went to that trouble. I said, well, I tried emailing you a bunch of times and didn't hear anything back, so I got worried. Um, so if that system does work, so for those mm -hmm. who might be relatively new to USU, it's very easy to file a student concern report. They want to know what steps you have taken um, to try and reach that student, but it's straightforward. I wanted to revisit an earlier question and, and hear from more of you about the challenging conversations. We, we had a question earlier about kind of an academic situation where you, you have to deliver bad news. I've had a number of situations um, where students have come to me more with personal life issues health issues, family issues, divorce, uh, children, things of that nature, my immediate response is you know, to listen and also say, hey, we have a great counseling service. But they, it seems to me they expect me to help them deal with it right there, whether it's some sort of change in the course, which I may or may not be willing to do, but to, to help them through that problem in my office. Um, so I'd like to hear from you and other people in the room, what are some of your strategies in dealing with that in a professional, and sometimes I feel like I might need to be a little more detached. I can't, you know, it's, you have to have just a little bit of separation. You're not their priest or their counselor or their mom. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody finds it as hard as I do. <laughs> it, it is, it is. Um, for me, uh, the students that have come to me with problems have been main, mainly economic problems. And I found through the five years that I've been here that Utah State has a philosophy of only helping students that are going to make it, and not those that are struggling. So I uh, usually uh, look for signs. If they're asking for food, or if they're not, um, if their clothes is not washed or signs like that. So, for example, I had one student one time explaining to me exactly um, how the food was divided by day and wanting to trade with my food uh, because um, she didn't have enough food. 
So uh, for, for my students uh, in the Latino community, a lot of them work one or two jobs. And I feel that if we have, I know there's a make it or break it fund out there that you know the student has to apply and has to go through uh, an interview to see if they're given money. Um, it's another extra step for them. I know it's so it's administrative, but listening to them and I don't know, helping them right then and then. There is a food pantry, a student-run food pantry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I know it's on Logan campus. I don't know about our regional campuses, but that, that is another resource for that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for, in my case, I have found uh, economic, the economic part. And yeah, um, their parents most likely are working one or two jobs, or maybe going through a separation. But it's an economic problem for the most part uh, that I find myself with. And I have helped a couple of students, I don't know, at least five students with, uh, and helped them through the system. But uh, it, it is a difficult talk because, but you have to look for those signs, mm -hmm. and it's case by case. I would say I think a lot of times I have students that come in and want to. You have to often walk that line between personal and professionalism, and it's sometimes difficult. Um, I think a lot of times students come in and want to tell me a lot of details. I don't know, you know, I don't have any data that supports this, but I think just being female, a lot yeah. of times they want to just mm -hmm. disclose a lot more information than they would with a lot of my male. And I think there's also a different expectation in the response. Yes. Um, I think sometimes students feel more free, and maybe this is good or bad, I don't know, to be more emotional themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes wonder, you know, if I were a gentleman in this chair, would I be dealing with some of the same issues? And I'm betting maybe not. Yeah, and I, like I said, I, I don't know that. That's just kind of my anecdotal experience. But, um, and so it is sometimes, I think, really difficult to walk that line between personal and professionalism. And a lot of times I do, I listen. I do try and be compassionate and being, and, and listen. Um, and sometimes that's all a student needs, is just needs somebody to listen. Um, if they start wanting me to solve their problem, that's where I, you know, I listen, then I refer. And I, and I make good referrals. I know who to refer to, and I know exactly. And, and it may involve me making a phone call or an email to somebody specifically, but then I refer. Um, and then I, I try and redirect back to, you know, what are we talking about today? What about my, the mentoring or class? What are we focusing on today? And kind of have to do that sometimes. And, um, but it is tricky. Well, I appreciate you um, talking about the student concern form, and if I, you can probably find it by just Googling USU student concern, but you can also get to it if you go to thrive.usu.edu. Um, that's our website for all things student success retention related, um, and there is, there is a tab that says faculty staff resources, and that form is on there. We also have a referral form. If it's not uh, I'm concerned about this student's well-being or the well-being of others because of this student, which is what the student concern form is. If it's more, the student hasn't been to class for three times um, and hasn't turned in anything, it's more I'm concerned about their persistence. There's another form for that and then that comes to me and I can try to make contact with them and try to do some intervening as well. So there's the two forms and they're both there at thrive.usu.edu. I have sort of a related question. Um, a lot of my students, as you were mentioning, have full-time jobs and families. They have to leave class for their jobs. They get phone calls about their jobs and families all the time. And I'm very open to, like, if it's class and they have to walk out, whatever, like, they can do that. But it also gets in the way of group work and assignments. And I would consider myself a pretty strict professor. Um, and I always kind of battled myself about whether I should, you know, maybe lower my expectations, make things more flexible. Because I know that, you know, by being more strict, I think that I'm making things harder for students who already have more responsibilities. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to change my expectations mm -hmm. because I want to hold everything to a high standard. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I, you know, we've, we've had this conversation um, several times at the regional campus 
campus system because our students are traditionally more, you know, working and balancing other things in life than, you know, a 19, 20 year old. Um, but, but I would say loud and clear, don't, 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 lower, don't lower your standard, standards at, at, at all for them and, and, and expect, expect the same quality from them but maybe add some flexibility to, to, to their lives that, 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 that would help them. But I would never say lower, lower anything. And, and we found, we, we found I, I, and again, Jan, anecdotal, um, students that feel challenged, I think often rise up to that challenge. And, and so I would say be flexible, but still maintain your, your high standards as you would with any you know, face-to-face -face class. Yeah, it's it's bend but don't break, right? So I think you have to figure out what that looks like for you. But there's places where I think flexibility is easy to to come by, and there's places where it's not. I mean, just a recent example is have a student who's a senior in in their doing their field practicum, and they have to complete. 480 field hours to graduate. That is not, it doesn't matter if he has a full-time job or doesn't, or it doesn't matter. That rule stays. And so, you know, he came in to meet with me. I'm really struggling. I'm working full-time. I, but I'm not getting my hours in. What can I do? And this was a hard conversation. You have to get 480 hours. So that stays, what else can give? And he ended up making changes to his work schedule. He actually went back to part-time. and So he had a hard conversation with himself. He said, how much am I gonna sacrifice to get this degree? And, and, and so we had those conversations and made it work. So there's sometimes where, where you give and sometimes you, you just can't. Yes, the key word right here is flexibility, most definitely. And to expect um, that all monkeys are gonna climb the same tree at the same time, uh, I think that differ differentiated teaching comes into play where they can get to the top of the tree in different ways. Yeah. yeah. I got a question, so a lot of the, the strategies that all here, um, I think can be generalized. Like I think we can use this with a lot of population of students. So my question is, um, let's say you have a limited amount of resources, and you and you wanted to really get the most bang for your buck, if you will. And this question is for everybody here. Um, and you wanted to really sort of, there, there'll be the, there's a group of students, uh, sort of profile of a student that's on the fence. And Neil asked a question that was kind of digging for this. What are the indicators that may identify that student? What is that student profile? If we were to take limited resources and really go after that student, what does that student look like? Where are they at in their degree? Are they, are they freshmen? Are they senior? Are they, I, I've heard today, first generation students. I've heard, I've heard a lot of sort of similar sort of profiles of the student. Which one of those would you say would be the ones to really go after? We really wanted to target group initially or pilot group. What would you recommend? Are you asking what are the indicators, John? But what are some of the indicators yeah, you'd look what at? What that student looks like. What do you think? And, and this comes from our student service team and, and some of the work of Taylor Adams. I, I know they had a meeting recently and, and I don't know maybe some of our student services uh, out in the basin or others could chime in here but I know one of their strong points was that if they were taking three credits instead of six that was a real risk factor for, the, for, for them completing so that might be an indication that you would look for and to try to help them you know either through scholarships or tuition waivers but have a hard conversation with them about you know, maybe instead of working full time, how could what could you do to up the six credits instead of three, and how could we possibly look at as an education system to ways to support that? Yeah, 
And on Logan campus, it's 15 credits. So taking less than 15 is an indicator. I would say, you know, there, it sounds like there's definitely some objective measures. I think one of the, um, not that it's super subjective, but it's a little bit harder to kind of grasp and figure out is the student that isn't as resilient. Um, I think that was harder to assess, but it really seems to be an important indicator, not just with academic success, but in many different areas of life. And if you could figure that out, um, kind of hone in on that, that would be something to kind of target. Would you include like growth mindset slash resilience? Yeah, in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of lump that together. Yeah, Matt. I think as a student who wants to get in your major and doesn't have the GPA to do it, in communication studies we struggle with that. But they, they have the desire, they've taken some classes, but their GPA is not going to get them into the requirements to graduate. And, and, and like Michael's saying, but they have to get through that door, they want to get through that door, then they're just stuck. We have, we have, obviously we have way too many of those students on campus, but. Those are the ones that you, like Derek said, you have that hard conversation with. But for me, that's a big indicator. Because they want to get in and the door is shut. Yeah, and I'll just, building on that, when I was at the UNA Basin, um, I did some research on the turnover there. And we dug a little bit deeper into who was not there uh, one fall when they were there the fall before. and did some survey and questionnaires uh, with those students, actually phone interviews. And it, I think what we found is that most of these students that we lost were not tied to a major. They were floating. And so we have to figure out a way to get them into their major pathway. I think there's, there's a couple things that go with that. One is, is this sense of community that we've all been talking about that they have to find a community and feel at home in that community and the and being grounded in their major uh, does that for them and so we have to figure out how can we you know and there, there there's going to have to be some redirecting into other pathways but once the students in the basin had hit those upper division courses we rarely lost them you know, if they might need to, to drop out for a semester, they had twins or, or whatever, but then they would, we would find them to come, you know, coming back. But if we lost them as freshmen or sophomores, gone. And so we have to find ways to get them plugged into community. And maybe it's through majors, getting them channeled more quickly into majors. And maybe it's more of what Crescencio is doing, more of that social community early as well. Uh, I think he, any of those pathways are going to help us. Other thoughts? I also think a big factor is the economics. I lost two students last semester mm -hmm. who did come into my office and say, you know, we don't qualify for Pell Grants, our parents make too much, but based on some things that were happening at home, they actually had to move back home and work full time to help support their family because of yep. what was going on. So they had to drop out of school. And that was just two cases that came to me personally. Yep. So I think economics really plays a huge factor in it. We're losing students or they're you know, not taking as many credits because they're working for you know, two, three jobs to try to make ends meet, to try to pay their minimum bills here. Um, but they don't qualify for Pell Grants or you know, other financial aid because their parents make too much. There's so many students that are in that boat, it just blows me away. Along those lines, if you again go to Thrive um, website and in the um, faculty staff, you can actually nominate um, students for retention scholarships. And um, students who are in a situation, I mean, if they need to go home and have mom and dad, that's probably a little bit different. But um, but there are students that are able to get help, whether it's you know, a little bit. I had a student in my office today and she just needed a few hundred dollars to be able to stay this semester. And that made a difference for her. And so these aren't huge scholarships, but they're scholarships that are helping students stay an additional semester when something happens. And anyone can, any faculty or staff can nominate students for that. So, yeah, well, there was a comment. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I, 
know what those indicators are for what group or what uh, key um, outward thing or inward thing that we can measure that targets this person. That would be really interesting to know in my experience. And again, this is not scientific. I'm a veterinarian, not a counselor. I'm not a professor, um, even though that's one of my role statements. It's, it's, I'm a veterinarian, and I wasn't trained in this, right? I mean, it's sort of something that we do. And, and, and in fact, with me, it's my minor role statement. But what I've noticed is a student that's not able to deal with crisis. So something in their life happens, and maybe it's resilience, maybe they're not able to adapt. And then the pattern is it's crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. It's panic to panic to panic. It's test to test to test. In my experience, that's the person that sort of uh, somehow gets behind, you know, and just, but it, Every time you change something in the class, maybe it's even something as simple as a test date. Oh my goodness, it's in the syllabus, it's locked in, how can you do that? And there may not be anything in their life that's preventing that date, but that this change in some now becomes a crisis. It's the first missed assignment or the first quiz that they don't quite do well on. I, I've seen that too. It, especially if I have a lot of things that are due on a schedule. And I put it all in Canvas, and it's all there the first day of class. But there's some students who, because of whatever reason, can't keep up. And you start seeing this just at the beginning of the term, and then it's like a domino effect. And that's that's one thing I try and do and reach out to them and say, okay, you were late this time. Um, you Let's not be late. What, what can I do to help you get this on your calendar? Do you need a reminder announcement? I, I use announcements on Canvas more than I do emails, and it seems to work. Um, but if I were going to use an indicator, it's that performance in the first several weeks of class that really kind of set the trajectory for that semester. And I only get students really for one semester. I only see that I don't see them repeatedly in multiple courses. But mine's not necessarily performance like that, and I think that that's probably good, and it's a great point. Mine is that mindset. That it's the mindset. It's just they'll spend more time lamenting about how they were unfair. <laughs> how the test treated them unfairly, or that they don't know where to start on an assignment. So they spend more energy um, lamenting about the assignment than actually discarding. No. It's that sort of mindset. My second is, is this, uh, is a student that uh, is, now I've lost, now I've lost my money, I'm train of thought, I'm 51. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, not only is it this crisis to crisis, it's, the, it's, it's also that, that student that's unable to adapt. And I think I think I've talked to that again. It, it might come to me here in a minute. Don't, well, I was, gonna, I was just going to say real quick. I Don't you think it has to do with that ability to you know, face adversity with mm -hmm. grit and resilience? Yeah, yeah and so, resilience is a term I, I think, think that's used. Yeah. I, I don't know how to measure that. I don't know how to look at that, right? Can, is there some quit, uh, something that we can give them in a connection? And now this is a, a non-resilient person, right? And, and so there's a little cloud that falls around, and we know that who that person is. The second thing was balance. That, that's what I wanted to get to. It's a student that doesn't know how to balance things in their life. So um, as heresy as this might sound, can you give up a few points have balance in your life. And there are students that cannot give up a perfect grade to have balance in life. Maybe they could get an A minus or a B plus, but they just cannot do that. So. And I was just going to make a quick plug for so the connections. I don't know how many what the percentage is of how many incoming students take that course. What is that, Lisa? What is it? Sixty to sixty-five. But I think we have, I mean, in that course, I think there is a great resilience component. There is that um, idea of balance. We're trying to teach them those sort of ideas. And so I think encouraging more freshman students to take that course, even if they are that student that is lived in Logan for a long period of time, and they're like, oh, I know everything about Utah State. They really, it has a lot of those um, components that it hits on in that first year experience course. Yeah. I think I wanted to bring up that we're not talking about, talking about indicators, but I don't know if the statistics are here. If anyone knows this, I'd be really interested to know. But women and ethnic racial minorities are more likely to drop out of STEM majors. It's yeah. something that's 
influenced by the research. And so to me, it's like, you know, even if students are not struggling, like reach out to these students if they're in your classes. And that's, you know, and especially here, you know, in my classes, I might have one racial and ethnic minority student in the entire class. It just, whether or not it's going to make a difference, I don't know, I just feel like we should try. They are a, a, a huge minority in, in yep. the classroom, so. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to take John's question and put it back on you, John, because I know you know a lot in this area. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Well, here, here's my thought. Um, many of you may or may not know, we have access to a lot of data and a lot of insights on behavioral data. And, and yeah, we can narrow down a profile of a student pretty well. But as a father and as a husband, I have learned, and this is to your point, Carrie, you are the expert, but I have learned that when my child or any of my children gets sick, when we go to the doctor, she knows exactly what's wrong with that kid and just goes to the doctor to validate it. So that's what I'm really asking of you. I, yeah, I can look at the data, I can pull up the statistics, and, identify at risk minorities and so forth. But it really comes down to your gut and your intuition of what you're seeing as an experienced faculty member and students that have succeeded, students that have left. What is it that you're seeing? What is it that you're and what are those things that make you think, oh no, Billy, he's he can do something. What is it? And what is it about? And it could be kind of what Carrie was saying. They just they, they don't handle conflict, or they're everything's a crisis. But does it need to be? It's a skill that maybe they may not have developed. That's that's kind of what I'm I'm wondering. And it's hard to measure. It's hard to measure resilience. It's hard to measure grit. But it's something that I think all of you could identify. You know, once you get to know some of the students, I'm just wondering what how do we start. To And on that note, I think we need to end, but thank you, first of all, to our panelists. Um, I really appreciate your the work that you're doing and, and very much behind the scenes and, and in many cases without any kind of mandate. You're doing it because you care about students, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate all of you that came. And um, so have a great week. If you want to consider Teaching Connections, since Jen brought that up, um, it, the application does open tomorrow, and you can go to the Connections website and find that application. We are always looking for qualified faculty to teach that course. And um, again, thank you. Go visit the Thrive website as well. Appreciate it.